to the Kahilu Theater's Makana series. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the Lee family and Lakeside Industries for making this year's Makana series at the Kahilu Theater possible. Without their funding, we would not be able to make these 24 events available free to the public. Now, oh, I heard somebody turning off their cell phones. That's probably a really good thing to do tonight, so you might want to take this opportunity to get that done. And at this point, I'd like to introduce to you Keck Observatory's Director of Development, Debbie Goodwin. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. You all came, even on a wet Waimea winter evening. I'm so glad to see us filling this beautiful theater. And I also want to give a shout out to Mariko and Fong in the booth up there, because not only is Greg speaking to all of you in the intimacy of the Kahilu Theater, but we are webcasting this lecture live around the world. And it's a new step for us because we have the Astronomical League and the Planetary Society partnering with us tonight. So we've been on their website for days, and it's pretty exciting to know that hundreds of people are taking part in this community of cosmic learning that we are here to do tonight. So Keck Nation lives and grows, and I'm very excited about that. Um, to introduce Greg Laughlin, I just had dinner with him, and what a great, great human being to come all the way from California in the midst of being a full-time faculty member, professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of California at Santa Cruz. It's not a trivial thing to fly across the pond, but he's here tonight. And it's, according to his bio, his interests and expertise are in the areas of extrasolar planets, we also call them exoplanets. How many of you don't know what an exoplanet is yet this evening? You can raise your hand, it's okay. Well, tonight you'll know. And see, I used to think about exoskeletons, exoderm, but now exoplanets right here. His also interests are in numerical astrophysics and the astrophysical details of the extremely distant universe. I can safely say that his idea of epic is very different than mine. He received his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Illinois and his master's in, in astronomy and astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz. But however, his travels have taken him far since he, he's been practicing to places like NASA Ames, um, UC Berkeley, the University of Michigan, and Tokyo, Japan. His co-author of the book, The Five Ages of the Universe, which was written way back at the end of the 20th century. And you'll learn tonight that things have changed with our understanding greatly of the cosmos. So please fasten your seat belts as Greg takes us on an exciting tour of exoplanets and the cosmos and give a warm Waimea welcome to <laughs> Professor Gregory Laughlin. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I, I believe that this is the first time that I have been live on what is advertised to be a Broadway stage. So hopefully, hopefully my show will live up to that. Um, so let me go ahead and start the, uh, the uh, slideshow here. So I'm going to be talking about the search for extrasolar planets, and in particular, the search for worlds like our own. We really are at a really important juncture in human history. <laughs> and uh, we are really right on the verge of knowing about planets orbiting other stars that are, are, are very much like our own Earth. And so in the course of this evening's talk, I want to give you a sense for how we've arrived at, at the present moment. Um, <clears throat> so this, this picture I, I took from my front doorstep, and you can see the telephone wires here, and you can also see a, a thin sliver of a crescent moon. And what you may be able to see, perhaps not, if I get the laser pointer here, I might be able to point it out, is that right there, there's a little spot, spot of light. Do you see that? Yeah, so 
I, I took this picture with a five megapixel camera, just an ordinary digital camera, no, no, no zoom lens or anything. I put it on my computer and I, I blew it up as much as possible. That, that little point right there is the planet Venus. Venus is a, a world very similar in size to our, our own planet. And if you take just an ordinary camera and take a picture of Venus, what you see is that it's not, it's not a perfect point of light. It, it has some sort of structure, right? These are the individual pixels right here. And it's clear that it's not just one pixel. There's, there's, there's something going on here. But with an ordinary camera, you, you really have no idea of what exactly that is. It's, it's, it's a mystery. Um, and this is very much the situation that Galileo was faced with when he built the first telescope for astronomical observations and, and turned that telescope to the skies. He looked at the moon and he was able to see the craters on the moon, the mountain ranges on the moon. And when he looked at Venus, he, he, he had a view that was very similar to the one that, that, that we have just with an ordinary five megapixel camera today. And so he had this sense of, 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 of mystery. No one had ever seen uh, what he was seeing. And so all through the year 1610, he, he observed the planet Venus with his telescope and tried to figure out what was going on. And finally, after about a year of observation, he decided that he was pretty sure that he, he, he had the right answer. Now, he wanted to get credit for his discovery. He wanted to have his cake and he wanted to eat it too. He wanted to get credit for his discovery. And if he wasn't right, he didn't want to be embarrassed. And so he, he faced kind of a quandary, like, ah, how, do I, how do I get credit, but at the same time, you know, don't, don't, don't get embarrassed if I'm wrong. He um, announced his discovery in the form of an anagram. And so what he did was he took his discovery, he wrote out what his discovery was, and then he took all the letters of that statement and then he rearranged them to say something else. And this being the 1600s, he wrote out his discovery in Latin. And then the anagram reads this, Hec immatura a me I am frustra legenter o why. And what, what that translates to is he's saying that these are at present too young to be read by me. And so if you can take the letters, the Latin letters, and rearrange them, then you can find out what his discovery really was. And so on New Year's Day uh, in 1611, he unscrambled the anagram. He was sure enough of his discovery that he was willing to unscramble it. And when unscrambled, it doesn't make any more sense than... Um, than the scrambled version. Like, I, I wouldn't be sure whether this was the scrambled version or whether this one. But this is the unscrambled vision, version. And it, it says, Cynthia figuras emolitur mater amorum. So the question is, is what, what does that mean? This, this translates, the Latin translates to the mother of love imitates the figures of Cynthia. And so what, what he means here is that the planet Venus, as seen through his telescope, that is the mother of love, shows phases just like the moon, imitates the figures of Cynthia, it's the, 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 the goddess of the moon. And so what Galileo had realized was that he was sitting here on Earth observing Venus at different parts of its orbit, and he could see that Venus was going through a set of phases. In the picture that I took, Venus was in something like this particular phase, or this one. It was in a gibbous phase. And during the course of Venus's orbit, he saw it go through crescent phases. And he realized that that meant that Venus is on an orbit around the sun and it's a smaller orbit than the orbit of the Earth. 
And that moment was incredibly important because it, it sort of showed that Venus is a planet like our own Earth. That was in some sense the first discovery of another world. The planets, of course, had been seen since ancient times, but they were thought of as just sort of points of light that were wandering in the skies. And, v and Venus, through Galileo's telescope, he realized that it was a world like our own. So that was a, a very important time in human history. I've got to get this thing on my ear correctly. There we go. Um, and so you can get a similar sense of the sort of discovery of the Earth as a planet when you, when you take off from an airplane. Um, when, when I flew here from San Francisco or flying out of San Jose in California, as you lift up off the surface of the Earth, you sort of see how you're the world that you're familiar with, a world where, where your life takes place, the, the, the streets of your hometown kind of fits into the, the, the scale of, 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 of the map. And by the time you get up to 35,000 feet up in the airplane, you get a sense of the sort of the, the, the whole vast size of the Earth. It takes hours to fly from San Francisco to Hawaii, and during that time, you really get the sense that you're you know, sort of on the surface of a, of a giant sphere, that, that, that you're living on a planet. And that was made really manifest in the late 1960s with the, with the lunar missions. This is a picture taken by um, the Apollo 11 mission on the way to the moon, and it shows the entire, the entire um, western half of North America. You can see the limb of the Earth, you can see the ocean, the clouds. The astronauts were the first people to actually see the Earth as a planet, in the same way that Venus had been seen by Galileo as a planet. And um, there's, there's an amazing recording, and this is from the Apollo 8 mission. Apollo 8 uh, was the first mission to actually leave the Earth orbit and head out toward the moon. Apollo 8 went out to the moon in 1968. They orbited it several times, and then they came back. They didn't land, but that was the first time that human beings had left low Earth orbit, actually left for deep space. The space shuttle and the International Space Station orbit just about 260 miles up above the surface of the Earth. So the, the space shuttle is, is basically orbiting since 1972. No one has seen this view since 1972 with their own eyes. And in 1968, you, there, there was a recording, I think, which is perhaps the most, much more important than the moon landing. I think it's the most important recording in, 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 in all of history. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to play it. Now, Debbie had the microphone that she used. Is it, is it right? It's right here. Okay, and so hopefully we won't get some horrible feedback. Um, and so what we're going to hear here is the um, first time that somebody has been able to see the entire Earth all at once. This is Captain uh, James Lovell of the Apollo 8 mission. So I'm going to put the microphone up to the speaker, and we'll see if this works. We'll play it a second time, because I think it's, it's really profound. So that, that moment there, when he says that he can see the entire Earth through the center window, that was the first time in history that somebody could say that and not be on drugs or, or, or be crazy. He was, he, was, he was really seeing that. Um, that, I think, was the most profound uh, uh, sort of moment in, 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 in human history. And what's interesting is if, if we listen to it one more time, the, the, the ground control isn't getting it, right? They, they, they're like, oh, you picked a good day for it. And the, the point is, is that, that, that every day is, is a good day to see this view. So let me just play that one more time now that you know what you're, what you're hearing.
so yeah, it's, 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 I, always, I always get a kick out of that. Um, and so, you know, they, 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 they flew so that the earth was not, no longer filling the entire window, but it was actually just a small blue marble uh, in, in, in the middle of the, of, of the window on their, their trips to the moon. It was quite an amazing accomplishment. It's, it's somehow unsettling, the fact that, that, that no one has seen that view since the last Apollo mission in 1972. Um, and so, with the Apollo photographs, we really see that the Earth is, is, is a planet. And it's one of the eight or formerly nine planets in our, our, our own solar system. We've talked a little bit about Venus. Venus is very similar in size to the Earth. If I was to put the Earth here, it would just sort of overfill the size of Venus. And we have several different types of planets in our solar system. We have the terrestrial planets like Earth, and Venus, and Mars, and Mercury. And then we have um, the ice giant planets, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune, all of these pictures are to scale, so the Earth is just a bit larger than Venus. Uranus and Neptune are about four times the radius of the Earth, and they have masses of about 15 times as much as the Earth. They're made mostly of water. They're sort of enormous balls of water under an incredibly high pressure and temperature conditions, very alien, extremely alien worlds. And then there's Jupiter and Saturn. This is a picture of Jupiter. And this picture also is, is staggering because if you look from Earth with a telescope, Jupiter is so much further out in the solar system that you always see it fully illuminated by the sun. You never see Jupiter in a crescent phase. And Galileo would have, would have immediately understood that because of his studying Venus and seeing Venus further in the sun. And so this photograph right here, the fact that we have the night side of Jupiter seen in this photograph means that this photograph was taken out where Jupiter is, which is quite a stunning and profound thing. This is a, a picture from the Cassini orbiter as it headed out to Saturn and past Jupiter it took this picture that shows the night side of Jupiter and the day side of Jupiter out at Jupiter's orbit. And so that's the inventory of planets that we have in our own solar system. Jupiter is, is 319 times more massive than the Earth. This red spot here is a giant hurricane. You could put three Earths across and it would sort of just cover up this single giant storm. This, there, Jupiter has no solid surface. Uh, and so when a hurricane or a storm, a vortical storm gets going, there's nothing to stop it. It's been going around for over 300 years. And so even in our own solar system, we have this sort of abundance of, of bizarre worlds. Now Venus, here's a picture of Venus um, taken from a spacecraft. And when you look at Venus uh, through a telescope, a better one than Galileo had, you see this sort of white cloudy disk. And so, a hundred years ago, you could look at Venus and you can think, hmm, it's, it's, it's covered by clouds. It's probably, you know, those are probably water clouds. And so, as recently as the 1950s, it was possible to be scientifically credible and also imagine that Venus was this sort of lush, tropical world. This is actually a picture of Hawaii, as you probably know. But in the 1950s, it was possible to imagine that beneath the clouds of Venus, there was this lush, tropical paradise. In the 1950s, it was also possible to really think about interplanetary travel in a serious way. Von, von, Werner von Braun had been building rockets. They had, you know, it was, it was known that the space race was gonna take place. It was known that it was possible to travel to the planets. And so there was a space of a few years during the 1950s when there was a real possibility that we had a world like this sitting right next door. And I often wonder how history uh, might, might have unfolded if indeed that had been true. If Venus had really been like this, the whole the Cold War would have been very different, the space race would have been very different, it would have led to a very different trajectory for how human society evolved if we'd had a perfect world sitting right next door. Now, Unfortunately, um, Venus is not a perfect world. Um, we've sent spacecrafts, the Russians sent spacecrafts to land on the surface of Venus, and it's an incredibly 
horrible place to be. The atmosphere has more than 100 times denser than the Earth's atmosphere. The temperature is hot enough to melt lead. These spacecraft lasted just for a few minutes before just expiring from the incredibly corrosive conditions. Venus is, 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 is done as a planet. What's interesting is that a, a billion years ago, or a few billion years ago, Venus probably had an ocean, just like the Earth. And as the sun gradually grew brighter, Venus underwent a runaway greenhouse effect. Its ocean was boiled off, the carbon came out of its rocks, and it, it, it now has this sort of runaway hellish, hellish situation. This is what the Earth will be like in a billion years or 1.5 billion years from now as the sun grows brighter. So it's, it's, it's important to sort of realize that you know, planets are important to um, sort of preserve. Mars, too, is, is a, uh, you know, was, was very exciting during the, during the first half of the, the, the 20th century. If you look at Mars through a telescope, you can see its polar caps, you can see clouds, and it was imagined that Mars might, might be a habitable world as well, um, just as it was thought that Venus was. But um, in 1964, the United States sent the first space probe to Mars, flew by, took pictures, and the pictures, this was the first picture that came back, first close-up picture of Mars, and it was incredibly disappointing. It was a kind of crushing disappointment because it, it looks basically like the surface of the moon. There's, there's craters, it was clear that there was very little atmosphere, it was clear that it was very cold, it was clear that, that you know, all the sort of Ray Bradbury ideas of Mars weren't, weren't true. Mars is, is a better place than Venus. And in fact, this is, is one of our recent pictures from the, from the, um, the rovers on Mars. If you were transported to Mars, it, it, it actually doesn't look that much different than Kona. Um, <laughs> it, so it just takes a little bit longer to get there, right? You can, you can imagine cutting, cutting your feet on this, this, the, the, this sharp rock here. It's, it's nowhere near as bad as Venus, but there's no palm trees, there's no ocean, there's no beachcomber bar here on Mars. It's just this, this empty, empty expanse. And so, whereas in the 1950s it was possible to imagine that there were planets that you could visit and live on right next door, that's no longer possible. Our, our, our solar system, we have Earth, and then we have this selection of completely alien worlds, and this is basically as, as good as it gets in our own solar system. And so, for a sense of possibility, uh, you know, for the sense of sort of mystery and adventure, a truly Earth-like world, we're now faced with the problem of, of, of having to look around other stars. Um, you know, if you look up at the night sky, especially if it's dark, if you're at high altitude, you can see thousands and thousands of stars. And two questions sort of come up just naturally to mind. The first is, is how far away are those stars? What are they? How far away are they? And then the second question that comes to mind is, you know, are, are there planets orbiting them? Th these questions were first asked in, in the 1600s after Galileo sort of set the scale for our own solar system. And the first person to think about uh, planets orbiting other stars was this Dutch scientist, uh, Christian Huygens. This picture right here is a picture of Jupiter seen through a small telescope. Uh, Christian Huygens had a telescope that was good enough so that when he looked at Jupiter, just as Galileo did, he could see these four moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter from night to night. Jupiter is like a sort of a star with its own little miniature solar system. And so what Christian Huygens tried to do is he tried to look at nearby bright stars with his telescope and tried to see whether they were orbited by planets in the same way that Jupiter, he could see, was being orbited by its moons. And that makes sense, but what he, he didn't understand was the absolutely staggering distance to the stars. If I um, take uh, the, the, the Earth and shrink it down to the size of a sand grain, then the sun is like a dime held at arm's length from that Earth-sized sand grain. Um, taking the Earth and shrinking it down to the size of a sand grain means a demagnification of about 100 billion. 
If I take the sun, which I've shrunk down to the size of a dime, and then shrink the sun down to the size of a sand grain, then I've shrunk it down by a factor of about 10 trillion. I've made the sun about 10 trillion times smaller. If, if the sun is the size of a sand grain, then Alpha Centauri, which is the nearest stellar system, is another sand grain about six miles away. So the, the distances between the stars are just absolutely staggering. They're enormous. And, and Christian Huygens had, had no sense of that. Um, the questions of whether or not there are planets orbiting other stars and how far the stars away, how far away the stars are, were first asked in the 1600s, and it's taken hundreds of years for these questions to be answered. The distances to the stars, um, people first started thinking seriously about it in the 1600s, and it wasn't until 1838 that the first distance measurement, the first real distant measurement, was made to a nearby star. And that was made by this German astronomer, Friedrich Bessel. He used a very, very accurate telescope to measure the slight shift back and forth the star makes during the course of the year. And he was able to measure that it was roughly 10 light years away. So this was a huge advance because it was a problem that had been bugging people for 200 years until, until Friedrich Bessel solved it. And the problem that Christian Huygens um, posed has been uh, unanswered for, for more than 300 years, the question of whether there were uh, uh, planets around other stars. Now, if you look at Christian Huygens, you'll notice that, that, that he had quite a fine uh, head of hair, and you'll also notice that, 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 that Friedrich Bessel uh, had quite a fine uh, head of hair, and you'll notice that, for instance, I, I really don't, right? I, I, my, my hair's pretty short, and so it's kind of refreshing to know that the lead singer of Queen, um, Brian May got his PhD 30 years after uh, joining the rock band Queen. He was an astronomy graduate student in London in the late 1960s, became a rock star, stayed interested in astronomy, and just in the last few years actually finished up his PhD as he, as he turned 60. And so it's kind of nice to see that, the, that this 400-year tradition of <laughs> rock star hair has, has, been, has been continued on. And, and uh, the, the, the question of whether there's planets around other stars, which is also hundreds of years old, is, is, is now being answered. And so the real problem with finding uh, whether or not there's planets orbiting other stars is the fact that the stars themselves are so bright. The problem of trying to glimpse a planet next to a star is, is exactly the same as the problem of putting a searchlight, a very bright searchlight, on the moon, and then putting a firefly right next to the searchlight, and then trying to see the glow from the firefly against this much larger glow of the searchlight. They're bunched together. It's very, very difficult to disentangle the tiny amount of reflected light that comes off a planet from the huge amount of light that's coming from a star. That's why it's so difficult to detect extrasolar planets. Um, and so for, for, for hundreds of years, it was simply impossible to detect extrasolar planets. Yet during the last 50 years or so, it became very clear, increasingly clear, that there probably are planets out there orbiting other stars. This is a really, uh, this is a picture that I really like. This is a dark cloud of gas and dust out there in space. This thing is about a light year across and it contains roughly the same amount of mass as our own sun and planets, but ground up into a very fine form. And you can see this sort of dark cloud is blotting out the stars that are behind it. And if you observe this cloud carefully, what you see is that it's starting to collapse under its own weight. It can't hold itself up. Its gravity is causing it to fall in on itself. And during the 1990s, it became possible to do computer simulations, which would show what happened when a slowly spinning giant cloud of gas and dust started to collapse under its own weight. What, what happens is that you form basically a donut-shaped disk of gas and dust orbiting 
a, a newborn star in the center. This is a computer simulation that actually I, I did as part of my, my, my uh, PhD thesis back in 1994. And this is a picture that the Hubble Space Telescope took at about the same time. What you can see here is that there's a very small hint of a bit of a red glow right there. That's a, a newborn star inside a swirling cloud of gas and dust. And so it was very clear that when these clouds collapse, they form disks surrounding a newborn young star. The computer showed that, and the Hubble Space Telescope showed that. And we could study what would happen inside those, those, those clouds of gas and dust. This is sort of a picture of our own solar system size. This is the farthest body in our own solar system. This is the new um, dwarf planet that has a similar orbit to Pluto. This is the Hubble Space Telescope picture. It's something that's roughly the size of our own solar system. And we could see, at least in the computer models, that planets should be slowly building inside these disks of gas and dust. The, the analogy that I like to give is, is, is uh, what happens if you have a hardwood floor and you don't clean under the bed. This is an easy experiment to do, right? It's like an experiment that I myself am, am great at doing. Right? I'm really good at not cleaning um, up. Uh, and so if you, if you have a hardwood floor and you don't clean up, after like a week, you start getting dust under the bed. After two, three weeks, you start getting more and more dust under the bed. And what you'll notice is that the dust doesn't build up in an even layer. It forms these sort of dust bunnies. And if you take a dust bunny, you can take a dust bunny, say, put it on a flatbed scanner and make a scan of it. What you see is that it's like it's got this weird sort of fluffy, fluffy structure. And that's very similar to what happens in one of these protostellar disks. The dust sort of accumulates in these fluffy structures, which then collide with other fluffy structures and gradually build up to larger and larger dust bunnies. And you can imagine that if you didn't clean under the bed for a million years, um, the dust bunnies would be pretty large. And in fact, they would grow to be the size of planets. And so in the 1990s, we, we, we had the idea that planets should be forming very readily around other stars. And, and we expected that at the end of the day that we'd find uh, planets like the ones in, in our own solar system. Uh, planets like Jupiter, they're massive, that are farther out, and then planets like the Earth that are, that are closer in. And so the first extrasolar planet that was discovered around a star like the Sun came as a, just an absolutely complete surprise. The first planet um, that was found around a star like our own Sun was, was located in 1995, and it was found in, in one of the stars of the great square of Pegasus, star 51 Pegasus. It's barely bright enough to be seen with the naked eye if you know where to look. And what these two astronomers did was they measured how fast the star was coming and going along the line of sight from night to night. If you have a planet orbiting a star, then both of them are actually orbiting around a point of balance. So if this is the star, this hand right here, then you'll see as the planet goes around it, my left hand is coming toward you and going away from you and toward you and going away from you as the orbit progresses. And that's, that's what they measured right here. They saw that the star was coming toward us and then going away from us, coming toward us, going away from us, and this was going on night after night. And what was bizarre was that this planet had a mass that was similar to Jupiter, hundreds of times more massive than the Earth, but its orbital period was just four and a half days. It was just a total surprise. Mercury, which is the smallest planet, closest planet in our solar system to the sun, has an orbital period of 88 days. And then, you know, astronomers thought, man, that's, that's a short orbital period. That is a planet that's way in there. And this one, this first one to be discovered, had an orbital period of 4.5 days. And that came as an absolute and complete surprise, right? I can say that I was studying planet formation in the 1990s, and it never once occurred to me that we would find a Jupiter-like planet in an orbit that took only a few days to go around. This planet, if you could go there, this is a computer simulation of the weather on this planet, and it's, it would be an incredible sight, right? The, the, 
the, night, the day side of this planet is roughly 400 times brighter than sort of the brightest landscape on Earth. If you imagine the Sahara Desert, white sand, noon time, sun directly over the, the overhead. That's a lot of light. That's a bright scene. The, the daytime side of this planet is about 400 times brighter than that. And the day side is so hot that the weather here sends this incredible screaming jet stream around to the night side. And the night side is hot enough so that it's glowing with its own heat, with its own radiation. It's just like, this is a picture I took of a barbecue grill, right? And so you know that the coals of the barbecue, when they get hot, they start to glow. Um, the hottest parts are glowing sort of white hot. The cooler parts are glowing more orange. And the night side of this planet would be doing the same thing. It's hot enough on the night side, so it's literally glowing with its own heat. And you can see these jet streams that should be there uh, are, are outlined both the storms, and the storms are literally glowing with their own heat. So it would be an incredible sight to see one of these short period planets. Another way that these planets have been found and are being found with great frequency is through transits. So I just talked about this radial velocity method. And another method that you can use to discover them is through transits. This picture was taken in 2004. And it's hard to see here, but right here is the planet Venus in front of the sun. It was cloudy when this picture was taken. But if you look carefully, you can see that Venus is just starting to cross the limb of the sun. And when you have planets that have short period orbits, if the orbit is exactly edge on, then the planet will go in front of the star and it will block out a small part of the star's light. So if you observe very carefully, if you observe a star, you can't, you can't take a picture of the star and see the disk, right? We can't see the disk with the planet in front of it. All we get is the light coming from the star. And if we monitor the light very carefully over hours, as if a planet starts to go in front of the star, then the amount of light starts to decrease. And so a planet like Jupiter going in front of a star like the sun will block out about 2% of the star's light while this transit is occurring. And it makes this sort of dip, which lasts for a few hours, and then the planet is no longer in front of the star, and the star is back to its regular brightness. That's another way to find extrasolar planets, and it turned out that that's been a great way to actually discover planets orbiting around other stars. This, this star is one that, that a team that I was involved with uh, d discovered. And what I like about this particular planet is it takes exactly a, a weekend to, to go around. If you mark the position of the planet at noon on Friday, it makes one complete orbit over the course of a weekend, and it's back to exactly the same spot at 9.01 a.m. on Monday. So the year on this planet lasts from Friday at noon to 9.01 on Monday. And just a few hours, actually, after we discovered this planet, um, an amateur astronomer who had sort of keyed into this discovery was able to observe it in his, in his backyard. Um, so this, this, this guy's by day, he's the CEO of a biotech company. And by night, he observes um, planets using this transit method um, with this telescope in his backyard. And so transits are actually, you can discover planets quite easily. But the problem with a transit is that if you just see how much light the star is, is, is losing, that the planet is blocking, you don't know how massive the planet is. And to find out how massive the planet is, is a much, much more difficult endeavor. And so the Keck telescope, this is a picture of, of the Keck 1 telescope that you can see here from Waimea up on Mauna Kea, has been hugely useful in allowing us to, to find the masses of these planets. Um, the way this is done is the light from the star hits the telescope, and it's divided up into a very beautiful spectrum. And then that spectrum is imprinted with lines of, of iodine gas. And then 
spectra are taken night after night after night. And as the star comes toward you, all the colors shift slightly to the blue. And when the star is going away from you, all the lines shift slightly to the red. And you're able to detect the star being orbited by the planet and by measuring how much of a shift there is, and it's measured in very small speeds, sort of a couple meters per second, sort of walking speeds, you're able to discern how massive the planet actually is. So um, we've been using Keck, or at least astronomers that, 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 that I uh, uh, collaborate with have been using Keck and telescopes in Australia to, to monitor nearby stars, and we're making some uh, very interesting discoveries. This star is one of my favorites. This, this is the star 61 Virginis. This is also a star that's just barely visible to the naked eye. And what's interesting about this particular star is that if you go out and grab the nearest 400 stars to the sun, and you ask which one is the most like the sun, that is, which one is the most similar in age, the most similar in composition, the most similar in mass, the most similar in temperature, the most similar in size, the most similar in all of its properties. Um, this particular guy comes up, 61 Virginis, is the most sun-like star in the nearby galactic neighborhood. And so it would be very interesting to think, well, it's exactly like the sun in all of its physical properties. Does it have a planetary system like our own planetary system? And so in the last year or two, uh, we've observed, we've gotten enough data to find that here's the, the way this star's planetary system looks. Um, it has three planets that we can observe, and these three planets all fit within the orbit of Venus if it was our own solar system. So what I've done is I've taken the 61 Ver, 61 Virginis solar system, and I've placed it on top of our own solar system for scale. This is the Earth's orbit, Venus's orbit, Mercury's orbit. And these planets are very unlike the Earth, right? One of them has a mass of five times the Earth's masses, period of just four days, one that's 18 times heavier than the Earth, and one that's 23 times heavier than the Earth, all packed into a space that's roughly the size of Mercury's orbit. And so what this is telling us is that the process that gives rise to a solar system has a huge variety of outcomes. Even if you make a star that is exactly like the sun, the planetary system that gets made can be completely different from our own solar system. And this is a great example of that. Star is exactly like the sun, but the planetary system is completely alien from our point of view. If you look at this orbit, especially the 61 Virginis D, you can see that it's coming relatively close to the star here, and then it's going further away out here. The, the property of coming close and then going far is called uh, eccentricity. Um, a way to sort of imagine how an orbit works is if, if, if I have, if I have a, the, the Earth, say the Earth right down here, if I, if I were to drop this laser print pointer, which I won't do because it's, it's not mine, but if I was to drop that, it would fall and it would make a crack on the ground. And you can imagine that if I took the laser print pointer and tossed it to the side, then it would make sort of a parabolic arc before it hit the ground. And if I threw it to the side, it would make a longer arc before it hit the ground. And you can imagine that, that I take the laser pointer and throw it so hard that the Earth, and imagine the walls weren't there, the Earth basically curves out from under it as it's trying to fall to hit the ground. If I float it at exactly the right speed, it will keep falling and falling and falling and falling around the Earth. That's, that's the concept of an orbit. And I can, in fact, throw it so fast that it will go up to a very large distance away from the Earth and then come falling back with this kind of motion. An orbit like that is a highly eccentric orbit. And so we can kind of get a sense of that. This is a, a circle is shown right here. The solid line is a circle. And this is a mildly eccentric orbit. This is an orbit with an eccentricity of 0.2. Mercury is the most eccentric orbit in our own solar system. Uh, Mercury, here's a picture of it, has an eccentricity of 0.2. 
Here's, here's an orbit with an eccentricity of 0.4. You can see here that you know, it's, it's getting relatively close to the star at its near point. It's quite far away from the star at the far point. These are equally spaced positions in time. And so you can see that it's going quickly through the close point, and then it's going more slowly when it's far away. Here's an orbit with an eccentricity of, of 0.6. It's even more extreme. It's really zipping through its close approach and going more slowly through its far approach. This right here is a planet that was recently discovered, which has an eccentricity of 0.5 and an orbit with a period of a little bit more than five days. This planet, when it's close to its star, what we call periastron, it's getting 10 times as much energy from the star as it's getting when it's at its far point. And so over the course of its orbit, it's getting these crazy increases in energy. It has this very strong seasonal pattern, and we believe that there should be incredibly powerful storms generated on the surface of this planet. This is a weather model of the weather on this planet, um, which, which has this highly, highly eccentric orbit. Here's another picture of exactly the, the, the same planet. And what this is showing is, in a planet's point of view, it gets close to the star and it hits this huge burst of heating. This huge burst of heating sends weather fronts around both sides of the planet. The weather fronts are so powerful that they're traveling faster than the speed of sound. So the weather on this planet is actually shock waves, sonic booms, which are crashing through the atmosphere, colliding on the night side of the planet. And the whole planet is hot enough so that it's <coughs> glowing orange hot, even white hot, during this moment of close approach. And so when we look out at these planetary systems, we can sense that they are truly alien in comparison to our own. This is the planet that has kind of the craziest orbit that has been found yet. Um, this planet, I've taken our own solar system. Here's the orbit of the Earth. Here's the orbit of Mercury. This planet has an orbit which comes just a few times farther from the surface of the sun, star uh, than, than the star itself. It, it comes to a point where the star fills roughly a thousand times the size of the sun in the Earth's sky. But then it goes out and spends most of its time out at a point close to where the Earth is in terms of distance, right? So its far point, it's not that much farther from its sun, uh, mu 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 not much closer to the sun than the Earth is. And then it's going on this crazy orbit that lasts about a little more than three months. To, to illustrate this, I, I, I kind of like high-tech, low-tech demonstrations. What, what this is, is I, I printed the orbit out on a piece of paper. I printed the orbit here and I printed the circle. And then I, I took a, a kumquat and a, a red peppercorn, and then I, I, I took my, my, my camera, the same camera that I used to take that picture of Venus at the beginning of the lecture, and I made 100 pictures one after another, just putting the peppercorn on each spot. And then I, I put them in the iMovie and, 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 and made a movie. And you can see that one of the pictures, my, my, my fingers actually come in there with the, with the tweezers on one of those frames. And that shows what this planet is doing, sort of 111 days. Every 111 days, it comes screaming in for a close approach. And what we were able to do is we were actually able to observe the planet heating up as it made that close approach using, using the Spitzer Space Telescope. And so to show what happens, we we designed a kind of a synthetic mission. So the orbit of the planet is this, this purple curve right here as it goes close to the parent star. And then we put an imaginary spacecraft with a camera on it in orbit around the planet. And then um, we use the sort of laws of physics to allow that spacecraft to orbit the planet and, and, and kind of zoom and pan um, and show what we would actually see if we were really there. And so this next movie shows what the planet does as it makes this close approach to its parent star. So the spacecraft is orbiting the planet. The day side is, is probably very bright blue. And then the, the, the night side starts off dark, but then after that close approach, 
there are these incredible shockwave storms that are sort of going around at close to the speed of sound. And then as the planet goes back out toward its far point, those storms slowly quiet down, and you see just this, this, this dim, faint crescent. At the very end of this movie, the orbit makes a close approach to the planet, and so you'll see the planet kind of come up toward us and into the field of view at the end of the, of, of the movie. And this is as the planet is out near its far point, its daytime surface has sort of a blue illumination for the same reason that the Earth's sky is blue, and you can just faintly see the glowing storms that are still hot from that close approach to the star. So we're in this kind of really exciting time where we can really observe the weather on some of these more extreme extrasolar planets. Here's another um, of those animations, and this shows a, a, a planetary system orbiting the star, HD, HD, HD 73526. And these two planets are in this odd uh, kind of dance called a two-to-one resonance. Uh, the inner planet goes around two times <coughs> for every one time that the outer planet goes around. And they manage to avoid having close encounters that will cause them to have their orbits destroyed. Um, this is an animation of what the orbits are doing over a period of a few thousand years. You know, our own orbit is very stable, right? Every year is 365.25 days. Um, the Earth isn't getting further from the sun or closer to the sun or the time scale of an orbit. But these two planets, the orbits are, 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 are basically going nuts. From, from year to year, the two planets are pulling at each other. It'd be very hard to do scheduling on these planets because the year, it's like, oh, how long is next year going to be? Oh, it's only going to be 312 days long. Oh, well, right, it would, you know, like holidays, everything would be all screwed up <laughs> on these planets. And these are three different systems that, that we've been observing, all, all showing this same kind of, of, of crazy orbital dances. In this particular planet, right here, uh, HD 128311, it's two planets. The orbits are so crazy that they're actually crossing. And the planets always manage to kind of stay out of trouble and miss each other. It's a very delicately choreographed dance. And this dance, in this case, has been going on for literally billions of years. Now, other times, that, that, that dance doesn't work out quite so well. We see systems where there's evidence that there's been planetary collisions, where planets have been ejected from the solar systems, where they've smashed into each other, where they've collided with the central star. And uh, luckily, our own solar system is quite stable, but we now know that there's roughly a 1% chance in the next 5 billion years that, that, that Earth will collide with one of the other planets. But fortunately, um, that, that, that can't happen for at least the next several hundred million years. So as I kind of come to the end of, 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 of the lecture here, this, this plot um, I made last year, and it shows the rate that planets are the planets that they've been detected over the years. And so what this graph has is on the y-axis here is the mass of the planets. And the, the mass is in factors of 10. So this is a hundredth of Jupiter's mass, a tenth of Jupiter's mass, uh, one Jupiter mass, and then 10 times Jupiter mass. So there's a big range factor of 1,000 in mass here. And th these are just the years. So this was back in 1989. Um, there was an object that was about 10 times more massive than Jupiter was discovered. Then this 51 peg that I showed earlier was found in 1995. And then as the years have gone on, more and more planets have been discovered. And what you see is that as time goes on, the smallest mass planet that's been discovered has been getting smaller and smaller. And it basically is intersecting with the Earth mass effectively right now. We are now finding, and the Kepler mission has found, planets that are roughly the same size as the Earth. And so we're in this incredibly tantalizing moment. If I go to my very last slide here, it's the same as the, the, the first slide that I showed. Uh, this is the Moon and then a Venus up here, taken with the five um, megapixel camera. And 
if you have just a small telescope on Earth, then Venus is completely mysterious. And we're now in the position where we're getting information that's of kind of this quality for Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. And I think that the kind of the intellectual, the scientific adventure, Keck is going to contribute to this, space telescopes are going to contribute to this, even larger telescopes like the 30-meter telescope will be contributing to finding out what's there in what right, right now are just these alluring sort of points of light in the sky. We're going to find out what they're like. Are there worlds that are truly like our own out there? Um, that question is going to be answered within, within our lifetimes. And so I, I hope I've kind of given you a sense of this, this, this quest that we're on and given a sense of the excitement that, that, that astronomers and, and everybody is, is, is feeling right now about this sort of new age of discovery that, that we're embarking on. So thanks very much um, for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, the picture of Venus you showed looks sedimentary, like shale, and Mars is a completely different. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, so it looks, yeah, that's it, it, exactly right. It looks like these kind of slabs, but it turns out that those are basaltic lava slabs. It's not sedimentary where the Venera probe landed. It's, it's a volcanic composition, and they were able to get good chemical measurements to, to verify that. Now, it's believed that there's parts of Venus where there may be very deformed, metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. And so sending a, me a mission to Venus is no easy task because the conditions are so extreme. But if we do go back to Venus, we would want to land in one of those regions where there actually does seem to be sedimentary rock, but unfortunately the, the Venera lander landed on kind of a volcanic plain, not unlike out here in, a, in Hawaii. Did you compare that to Mars? And so Mars, what you're seeing, actually, that was a sedimentary structure in Mars. The, the, that was taken from the bottom of one of these craters that was once an ancient lake bed, and that was chosen very carefully by the mission designers. And so there were actually sedimentary rocks on Mars, even though that particular scene that I sent looked much more volcanic. So it sort of appearances can be deceptive. It's kind of exactly the opposite of what it, what it looked like. Yeah. So, or exactly, so, so, um, you know, it's like, who's it, Willie Sutton said, like, why did I rob banks? Well, that's where the money is. So we look around the stars because that's where the planets are. So we look for stars that we know are nearby that are as bright as possible because the more light that's coming, the, the, the better. And then we look around stars that are similar to our own sun as, as we can find. So for instance, Alpha Centauri is a great example of a star that, that's being focused on right now. It's the nearest star system to the sun, so it's very bright. It's similar to the sun. There's two stars in a large binary orbit. And so that's the kind of star that attracts a lot of attention. That's the kind of star that, that, that gets a lot of observations. And then we're hopeful that, you know, in the next few years that we'll be able to detect planets similar in mass to the Earth orbiting Alpha Centauri. So the target selection is by looking for stars that are like our own sun that are nearby. Yeah. How many stars have planets? How many stars have planets? That's a great question. The answer is at least half of stars have planets. Now, the question that you didn't ask, but probably everybody's thinking is, how many stars have planets like the Earth? That's not clear. The, the planets that we've found so far have been diverse, have been bizarre, have been very varied. Um, we're just dipping down to the level where we can kind of detect truly Earth-like worlds. And all the indications are that planets of Earth size and Earth mass are very common. So my guess would be something like 30% of stars have planets that are similar to the Earth in mass and size. How many planets have life? I have no idea at all. Yeah. How many satellites do we have looking for 
Um, so the, the main satellite that's looking for planets right now is the Kepler satellite. Um, which has been fantastically successful and has found literally already thousands of candidate planets. Um, there's another European satellite called Koro, which is doing a very similar thing, but it was launched earlier, and so it's not quite as advanced. And then um, once the planets are found, then there's various ways that you can observe them to get information about them, for instance, about their atmospheric properties. And to do that, we've been using this infrared telescope called the Spitzer Space Telescope. And then also the Hubble Space Telescope has been useful uh, as well for looking at the atmospheres or sensing the atmospheres of these planets. So there's kind of a small armada of spacecraft which have been used to varying degrees to both hunt for and to characterize these planets uh, once they're discovered. I got two questions. Sure. How f far away are we looking? I mean, our, our galaxy is enormous. We're looking at yeah. really small. We are really, so we need the brightest stars that we can get, right? So we are really looking in our immediate interstellar neighborhood. My whole talk, everything that I talked about, kind of took place within 200 light years of the sun. The galaxy, on the other hand, is about 100,000 light years across. We've really carefully surveyed a couple of thousand stars for planets, and the galaxy contains about 100 billion stars. So we really are just scratching the, the tip of the nearby iceberg. And you know the, the, the population of planets in the galaxy is enormous, and of course the galaxy is one of just 100 billion galaxies within our visible horizon. So there are lots and lots of planets out there. Yeah. Bring up that second slide, or the first slide of the Earth, the first picture of the Earth. There was a little thing down there that maybe it's just a star or something. This one? Oh. Uh, yeah, so this stuff, like, like, yeah. So this, what this stuff is, is the, the third stage of the rocket had just been ejected. So there was various, there was various, like, like gases and, and uh, stuff that was being vented and then, and then immediately freezing. And so, so that's just like small stuff that's kind of coming off the, 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 the spacecraft as it's heading out after the third stage has been ejected. You see that kind of thing in a lot of... No, 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 it's, it's nothing, nothing dramatic. It's just like something literally like this size. Yeah. So what, what Keck can do, and it plays a very vital role in this respect, is that, for instance, a Kepler satellite will find candidate Earth-sized planets, but it can't verify that the planet is actually there because there's various things that can, false alarms that can occur. For instance, you can have a bizarre situation where you have a nearby star that you're targeting, and then far behind that star is a binary star that's eclipsing in the same pixel on the camera. When that happens, it can look like it's a transit of an Earth-sized planet. And so what Keck does is it can follow these up and measure their masses and show that they're actually planets once Kepler has found them. So Keck has been responsible for the discovery of a huge number of planets from sort of Neptune mass and several times the mass of the Earth and larger, and then it's playing this role in confirming and validating the, the, the planets that are found from the space telescopes. So Keck has been absolutely vital, um, really has been a workhorse in sort of opening this new chapter of astronomy. So Keck can indeed get to the Earth size, especially if you, I've been talking a lot about stars that are just like the sun. There's a lot of stars that are quite a bit smaller than the sun, what we call red dwarf stars. Kepler can get down to, or sorry, Keck can get down to Earth mass planets orbiting these small stars, and indeed is getting very, very close to that already. Uh, not as many as one would sort of maybe expect or, or, or hope. I think that when everything kind of settles down, probably 10% of stars 
will have planetary systems that are nicely ordered, like our own. And the other 90% of planetary systems are going to be where something either screwed up or highly eccentric, right? So, so we see that diversity in planetary systems is much larger than you would expect from just looking at our own solar system. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the question was, um, are these highly bizarre eccentric orbits telling you something about how planets formed? And the answer is indeed they are. Um, what they're hinting at are sort of violent processes that occurred early in the history of the planetary system. Um, sometimes you can have perturbations from a very distant object which drive that circular orbit, which sort of originally forms, as you expect, into this highly eccentric form. Or you have several planets that form, they grow too massive, they start to interact, one gets thrown out and one gets left on an eccentric orbit. So the eccentric orbits are sort of show that there's been kind of violent dynamical histories in the, in, for many of these systems. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, is do we have any direct evidence for the atmospheres of these planets? And the answer is, is yes. Um, when the planets are undergoing transit, for instance, um, you're blocking out some of the star's light, but then you also have starlight shining through the planet's atmosphere as the planet is in front of the star. And so in addition to the star spectrum, seen for instance by Keck, you also get a small copy of the planet's spectrum. And that gives us direct compositional measurements. And so we can detect molecules like carbon monoxide, atoms like sodium, water vapor, um, all, all sorts of sort of the, 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 the atmospheric constituents of these planets. We really are getting direct information. Now, so far we've only measured atmospheres that are a lot hotter than the Earth because this has been done for planets that are in short period orbits. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, we should be able to get direct, this is called transit spectroscopy, of much more Earth-like worlds. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, is, is infrared used? Um, the answer is yes. So for instance, the Spitzer Space Telescope works entirely in the infrared. Right now it's, 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 it's run out of its helium, and so it's working at 3.5 of 4.5 microns. Hubble Space Telescope, however, works in the optical for these observations. So uh, Keck uh, works in the optical and in, the, in a little bit in the near infrared. And so basically the full infrared and optical regions are, are, are covered by the different space-based and ground-based assets like Keck that we have. Yeah. Actually, you're, 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 you're certainly right about red dwarf planets being numerous. Um, even though red dwarfs are dimmer, uh, because the size of the planet relative to the size of the star is larger, it's actually easier to detect planets orbiting red dwarfs. And so I think that the first measurements of Earth-like worlds are probably going to be made for planets orbiting red dwarfs, actually. <clears throat> yeah, they have to be much closer to the, 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 the star and they are in a situation where they show one hemisphere to the star. They're tidally locked, just like the moon is locked to the Earth. But the climate models indicate that that probably is all right as far as habitability goes. But we're you know, interested to, f to find them and, and, and actually see. Thank you, Greg. Oh, okay, you thank are you. a wonderful teacher. Oh. <laughs> I know you could go on and on. Before